All right, thank you, Linda, and thank all of you for welcoming me so much here uh, today. Um, I've been away from kiting for about nine years, and I just got back into it again last year. And as I look around, there's so many faces and names that I recognize from so many years ago, and it's, it's really good to see all of you again. Um, I got into kiting in 1989, and I started a company called Kite Studio. I don't know if any of you have remembered that company. We still own kite fabrics and kite spars and fittings and everything you need to um, build a kite. Um, we did that for about 20 some years because we got out of it back in around, 19, around 2000 and. Um, 15 after my father passed away, but those years are full of a lot of memories and um, it's, Like I said, it's really good to be back uh, During that time I also started a website called kitebuilder.com um, Right now it's out of commission, but I'm going to get it back real soon That was started around 2003 when the internet just came around um, on the, the forum was very popular. There's over 175,000 posts on the forum. Um, many of you remember that forum, and I have it here live this weekend. If anybody wants to take a look at it, you can um, take a look at some of the old posts and you know, email some things to yourself if you need to. Um, when Facebook got started around 2008, 2007, 8, 9-ish, I started a Facebook group called Kite Builders. Facebook group and that's also very popular right now. We have over 8,500 members, so I encourage you to um, take a look at that. Um, American Kite Flyers Association. I was the head judge for 14 years for the Kite Makers Comprehensive Competition. And um, when I started as head judge back then, there was no digital cameras. Um, all the pictures I took were all in Polaroids, and I remember getting my first digital camera that had a floppy disk that took about 10 pictures. Um, <clears throat> John Burkhart was my mentor back then. He's the one who got me into um, being the head judge for the AKA, and um, last year he ran MK, the Maryland Kite Society and asked me to do a presentation of some of the kites that I looked at when I was the head judge. Um, so it was, it was fun going back into the archives and picking up some of these old pictures. And the topic of that presentation was, what does it take to make it an award-winning kite? Um, and it was, it was met with, um, it was real popular, and I think word got out to Linda, and Linda contacted me and asked me to do it here this year, and I couldn't say no. Um, so, what makes an award-winning kite? These days, with artificial intelligence, chat GPT, chat GPT becoming more and more popular, um, I decided to go on the internet and go into chat and just ask a very simple question. What makes an award-winning kite? That's all I gave it, with no other direction, no other instruction, no other conversation. And in about 10 seconds, it came back with this. An award-winning kite usually has several key characteristics. One, design. The kite should have a visually appealing and unique design with well-balanced colors and patterns. Two, stability. A kite that can fly steadily in various wind conditions, maintaining its position and altitude, is often preferred by judges. Flight performance. The kite should have a smooth and graceful flight with good lift and control. Four, durability a kite that can withstand wind and weather conditions as well as the wear and tear of regular use is also highly valued. Five, craftsmanship. The kite should be well made with precise seams and sturdy construction. And finally, six, innovation. Kites that incorporate new and innovative features such as unique materials or designs can also be awarded. So that's about it. So if you want to make an award-winning <laughs> kite, that's all you have to do, okay? There's really no reason to go on, but I think we can go a little further with some show and tell and, and, and share some pictures of some of the things that I have seen over the years. But first I'd like to talk about what you don't need to have to build an award-winning kite. 
first thing that comes to mind is you don't need an expensive sewing machine. Um, if you go around to the workshops this weekend, you'll probably see, I don't know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars worth of sewing machines. Machines that are, are well in excess of a thousand dollars. But you don't need to start there. My first machine was um, my mom's old Singer machine. All it did was a straight stitch and a zigzag. And that's all you really need, as long as you know how to thread it and maintain it and use the right thread. Um, you can definitely um, sew a kite and win an award. Cindy Shannon is a perfect example to me. Um, she sews with a machine even smaller than this little than this the singer, and she's been sewing. Um, she's been she's been doing a lot of um, cotton clothing and um, quilts for many many years, and she her husband is also an award winning kite builder, and. She went into building some kites and won many awards with a, a machine that's older than this one. You don't even need a sewing machine. You can use a double-sided tape. And back in 1995, a very good kite builder, Dick Curran, um, I never met Dick, but I talked to him a lot, an awful lot on the phone. He bought a lot of fabric from me, a lot of spars. And he perfected a technique with using a uh, double-sided tape called a 9460 by 3M. And he, back in um, 1995, he wrote an article in Kiting in the winter edition. It's a very, very good article. It's, I think, six pages long. He talks about the different types of double-sided tape, the different um, ways he used it, how he put seams together, how he made spar tunnels, how he... Um, terminated the spars with pockets. It's a very good article if you're interested in, in using double-sided tapes. Um, you know, definitely download it and print it out. Um, if you can't access it, I also have it here on the computer. I can you know, email you a copy of it. And several years later, Dick Maceo came around in, in 2008, and he took uh, Dick's advice and went a little bit further with the graphics. And all of his kites were are made with um, double-sided tape. In 2008, he won second place in flat. He won second place in bowed. And then the following year, he came back. And in 2009, he entered almost a kite in every category. And every kite was made with um, red and yellow fabric. And he went home with a bunch of awards. He also did a website. Um, the website I don't think is available anymore unless you go into the like Wayback Machine archives. You can still um, download a copy of it called nosomac.com. Um, he describes his techniques and, and um, how he does all of his assembly. There's also a lot of information on using adhesives on the um, Kite Builder web, web, web page and their knowledge base. Um, and it also has a lot of discussion linked to the, the Kite Builder forums. Um, uh, you don't even need to use double-sided tape. You don't need a sewing machine, you don't need double-sided tape. You can um, put a kite together fully with just paper. Um, in 2005, Buteo Hang Hung um, entered several categories, these are two of them, and all of his kites were made with paper. The graphics were with magic markers or colored paper, and he went home with a bunch of awards. Uh, this is uh, second place in flat and first place in Rokaku. And he went further. He also entered a kite in the UFO category. This is a paper kite uh, glued together, and then he took a colored yarn, dipped it in some glue, and wrapped it around, and he ended up winning uh, first place in UFO. If you're applique challenged, you're having a, you don't really want to get into applique, and, and um, you can do a little bit of sewing, and you can use some spray paint to add color to the kite. Uh, design master paints are really popular, and if anybody knows of Scott Hampton, he's like the guru of design master paints. These are all kites that were made and painted. <laughs> I 
recently he posted this kite on the Kite Builder's Facebook page. Um, you think it's a dimensional kite, but it's really a flat kite, and all the dimension is achieved by the um, spray paint and you know the shading. If we, you don't even have to use um, spray paint. Um, all of you probably have heard of John Pollock. He is the guy who knows who developed his own technique for painting um, on ripstop. One of the problems with painting is when you paint on ripstop, a lot of it, times it goes on opaque. And when the sun is shining from behind, it just looks like a dark color. Uh, but John has a, a technique that um, is more transparent and works really well. These are two of his Grand Champion kites in 2004 and 2009. And the third one is of a character that some of you may recognize. Anybody know who that guy is? <laughs> it's um, John Burkhart. It's a good example. The kite is a good example of a tail and how the tail can really accent the kite. And John Pollock uh, was a four-time grand champion. These are the other two that won, uh, 2007 and also 2016. I know John is, is not under the greatest health these days, and I don't think he's doing too much more, any more retreats describing his technique, but his technique is still available if you dig back into the kiting archives in spring of 2007, he did, I think, a four-page article on um, what kind of paints he uses and how he uses them. I also have this article here if anybody would like it. Uh, two other examples. Um, in 2009, John Burkhart won third place for this flat kite. He took the painted fabric and then chopped it up into pieces and then applied it onto um, the sail. The second example is the cooperative kite from um, Jim Cosby and Sue Lennon. Cooperative is a category that um, a lot of people forget about. If you're not real good with graphics, but you like to sew, or um, if you're good with graphics and you don't like to sew, you can enter a kite in the co-op category with a buddy. And in this case, Jim did all the sewing and assembly, and Sue Lennon did all the graphic work. Two other examples, um, 2008, Harold Ames and Mike Mosman got together and did some tie-dyeing on ripstop. And in 2003, this is an example of John's uh, kite that he printed on paper and won best use of traditional materials. So, what is kite fabric? Um, I wrote in Kiting Magazine in 2010 um, a long article, this is just a, a portion of it, and what I used to always say is there's no such thing as kite fabric. Kite fabric is the fabric that you use to build a kite, period. You can use anything to build a kite. I've been judging kites for 20 years and I've seen many fabrics. Bed sheets, blue tarps, tree leaves, uh, plywood, raincoats, suit lining, webbing in those old woven lawn chairs, various plastics and papers, potato chip bags, pizza boxes. I even saw a flying bra at a festival. So anything can really be used. It's just that some fabrics work better than others. If you are making a large high wind delta and want it to be stable, a bed sheet makes an excellent kite fabric. The porosity actually increases stability. It's just that in these days, many people want a fabric that is lightweight, strong, durable, easy to work with, has porosity close to zero, and availability in colors that look nice in the sky. I know that was my goal when I started building kites, so ripstops fit the bill. The article I wrote was very similar to an article that H.P. Alexander wrote in March of 1989 for Cutting Magazine. Um, you know, if you're interested, pick that one up. But Tom McAllister in 2010, he didn't use ripstop, he used a dollar bill. And he made four or he made eight dollars into a, a cellular kite and um, won the cellular award. Um, Barb Paul, I don't have the year documented here, but she applied a dollar bills onto a green kite. She didn't win any awards that year, but she tried hard because I remember her handing out dollar bills to all the judges. That's <laughs> 
She was a great lady. Yes, sir. Uh, you can use wrapping paper. It's got a little, um, made uh, a fiber kite with uh, wrapping paper in one third place. Mike Enos in the year 2000 entered with a kite made of styrofoam and, and won an award. If you do use ripstop, you don't need an inventory of every color imaginable. You can win an award with a single color. Um, these are just, there's so many examples. These are just two. Mike Delfar in 2005, third place in figure. And uh, Barry Poulter, 2005, first place sky display. You don't need an inventory of every fitting imaginable. But it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> these are a few that we made. Um, when we, when we had Kite Studio, my, my dad's job was working in a machine shop, and these are some of the fittings I used to make for people. This is him. Uh, he used, that was his station in the shop. And you don't need a lathe, or you don't need a bunch of uh, drill presses. My dad, a lot of back when we started making the fittings, we were selling some of them for 50 cents. And we had so many different combinations of fittings that um, it was too hard to change the setup on every drill on the drill press. So my dad felt like, you know what, the part is 50 cents, but he justified buying a $500 drill, drill press just so he didn't have to change the jig. So we had, I think we had six drill presses and a milling machine, one lathe, and all, all kinds of stuff. Now these days, a lot of people are, are using um, printers to print parts. You don't even need to have that. You can go old school. You can just um, join two spars together with plastic vinyl tubing. You can make wooden fittings and um, make it work. Roy White in 2006, he loved the Andre rings and he wanted to build one. But that kite takes two different types of fittings, and it takes a lot of them, and it'd be a couple hundred dollars just to buy those parts if you can find them. So he was a woodworker by trade, and he went into his wood shop, and he started whacking out fittings made with wood and screws and washers and aluminum and ferrules, and he made the kite work. And from the ground at 100 feet, the kite looks great. You don't need to build a large kite. Um, this is one example from Bobby Stanfield who made large kites. But you can win Grand Champion with a kite that's only four or five feet tall. Tana Haynes has a perfect example from 1996. Don't forget about the fighter kite category. If you don't want to make a big kite, there's always the fighter kites. Um, there's so many examples of, of, of winning kites in fighters. This is just two examples. In 2010, Richard Hurd and Betty Hirschman. She didn't win a category award, but she won um, top novice. In 2007, Tom McAllister entered this cellular kite and won first place cellular, and he missed being grand champion by three one hundredths of a point. John Pollock won that year. And this is a, not even a rip. This is not a ripstop kite. It was it was all made with paper. You don't need a dedicated room for a workshop. Um, this is John Burkhart's workshop in Maryland. If anybody ever gets a chance to um, visit John, definitely get a tour of his shop. He's got one of the biggest collections of color um, fabrics that I've seen, and a great collection of kites. But a lot of us just make use of every room in our house. Um, you know, a kite table by day, dining room table by night. Uh, Mike Dertin made a um, first place Delta kite in 2022 on his dining room table. He balanced the kite from a chandelier in his dining room. Uh, who was the guy who was sewing in the back of his truck? We were just talking about that earlier today. Somebody was had a sewing machine in an 18-wheeler truck and entered the competition. I can't remember his name. I can't either. Yeah. You don't need a light table. 
They're good to have, but you don't need one. You can easily tape your kite onto a glass window or a sliding glass door, or on, I've seen people tape it onto a, a large screen TV. Um, if you do have a piece of glass, you can elevate the glass on the table and throw some Christmas lights under it. But they are great to have because you can see how your kite's going to look when the sun shines from behind. You don't need a college degree in graphic arts. <laughs> Who's that guy? <laughs> Phil made some excellent kites and won a bunch of awards with a pretty simple graphic. It just squares of fabric sewn together. Can I admit that that's the logo of a Thai restaurant in Rehoboth, Delaware? <laughs> so they hired a graphic artist and I just stole it. <laughs> Good skill. I love Pinterest. You don't need a fear of crashing or losing your kite. If you are really afraid of crashing or losing your kite, uh, you probably shouldn't enter a competition because it does happen often. You never can predict the ones. Perfect examples are um, these three. Uh, Pete Rondeau in 1995 entered that Edo that was framed in bamboo with custom bamboo fittings. Went up in the sky, folded in half, and crashed. Um, the same year, my dad entered a kite with uh, Glenn Haynes. Same thing happened up in the air, folded in half, crashed. And it happens to many kite builders, also to Mike Shaw. Back in the early days of the competition in, in AKA, uh, once you entered a kite, it disqualified you from entering the kite in future competitions. And over the years, we relaxed that rule, and we said, well, if you didn't win first, second, or third, you can enter your kite again in future competitions. Last year, we changed the rule even further. Um, if you never won, if you won first place, that's the only thing that disqualified you from entering your kite again. So it opened up the competition to previous kites that were entered. And Pete Rondeau is a perfect example. He brought this Edo back in 2022, sparred it with fiberglass and graphite, and um, successfully flew it and won first place in both that year. And Cliff Quinn tells a great story about the first time he met Reza. So I'm just going to take a little break here, and you can tell that story to keep it short. <laughs> so anyway, so we're in Ocean City, Maryland, and, and Reza and I are standing on the beach, and he's flying one of his one of his kites, and he was looking at me, and we were talking back and forth. He fumbles. He was using a uh, he was using a halo winder. The halo winder slips out of his hands, falls on the sand. He goes to get it, and the kite grabbed it and, and pulled it towards the water. And the kite went towards the water, and it went closer and closer. Next thing you know, the kite is sailing over the water, and the halo is in the water. It's putting drag on the kite, and the kite just keeps going. And I, and I said, oh my God, oh my God, it's a resin. And he said, yeah, he said, that was a chunky one. I didn't like it. <laughs> but he was, a great, he was a great man, great kite builder. And uh, if you see a kite flying in the sky, and it was he that made it, you'd know it right away. He had a, he had a signature. And, uh, and a lot of you people are going to achieve that same thing. You're going you're gonna to design a kite, you're going to fly it, and, and it's going to have a theme that you tend to put into the kites that, that you make. And uh, I think uh, Ron Gibbon can attest to that. When you look at when you look at his artwork, you can tell right away that's a that's a Ron's kite, and uh, and a lot of famous kite makers have done that very same thing. But, but that's my Rosa story. <laughs> Thank you. And so that's about all the things that you uh, do not need. Now we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that you do need. First thing that comes to mind is you need an idea, a vision, and some imagination. And there's a lot of imagination in this room. There's a lot of imagination all over the country. Um, but one a good example that I always choose is my father. This is a kite that he made in 2000. And my dad was an electrical engineer by trade. He was a 
a mechanical engineer by desire. And all of his kites were engineered, and usually a mishmash of other kites that he made in previous years. Um, this one had a, a, a white section in the front from another kite. He always liked to have parts of his kite moving around, so he added that stuff. Um, these rotators, some went clockwise, some went counterclockwise. The, uh, one of the first kites he made was a Bobby Stanfield Stone Mountain kite. So he threw some Stone Mountain wings on here. He loved the rollers, so he added a tail section and he had this fin on the top. And uh, he ended up winning first place, second place in cellular this year with this kite. This first white section was based on this kite that we made. Um, back in the, for the anniversary of Woodstock Festival, um, we were hired to make these four structures that were 30 foot wide and 40 foot tall. And um, at night when the concert played, uh, Aerosmith was playing and they raised these structures on both sides of the stages. And it was a pretty cool project that we got involved in. Um, and there was fall off fabric. The fall off fabric we turned into this kite. And we entered it into um, the Wildwood Convention in 1999. Um, I know Ron was there. Were you there when we no one flew? Oh, yeah. It yeah. went up in the sky, just roared as it, it hit that, that power zone. I think I was part of that flight. I was with you guys and we flew. Yeah, yeah. It flew. It didn't flew fly for a very long time. And then it came back down and you know, broke a few spars. Um, but it was a really, really cool day I mean, when we got there. Yeah. It so. I'm sorry? Even if it's up there for a few minutes, it's still a kite. Yes, and yes. Call it a kite. Yeah. And we, we put it together one more time after that. We repaired it, and we had it flying even better, but it wasn't in competition. And that's the last time it flew, so um, I still have it. It's still in my bag, and maybe one of these days we'll, we'll take it out and try it again. Well, again, there's so much innovation in this room and all over the kite community. I just went through some of my pictures. Uh, Merle Balmer, um, he loved making circle flexes. Um, and then he graduated and he started putting circle flexes together. And he put three of them together and called it a uh, uh, tricoflex. And then he took um, seven of, six of, one, two, three, four, seven of them and put them inside a big circle flex and added wind spinners and called it a turboflex. And that one um, first place at Smithsonian in 2012. Um, graphics. You, you got you, you to gotta play with your graphics. Think about ways to alter the graphics to make the kite more unique. Um, there's nothing wrong with this kite. Rokaku is, is a great framework for putting anything on a kite. And you can, you know, get some clip art, you can get your child to draw something for you, you can easily put it on a kite. But this is a hard kite to sew. Um, you have this long pointy tail, you got these um, 16 toenails, you got the white beady eyes, you got the lettering on the dog's name tag, that's really hard to sew. So why don't you go ahead and step further and expand the kite, expand the graphic, stretch it and crop it, make it bigger. This is way easier to sew, but you still have this Fido badge, so expand it even further. This is the easiest of the three to sew, and it's the most eye-catching if you ask me. But then some people will say, yeah, but I don't have beige fabric, I don't have brown fabric, they're really hard to find, I don't want to paint, I don't want to dye the fabric, what am I supposed to do? Well, we'll just look on your shelf and see what colors you have and substitute stuff. Make his, um, you know, make his nose section there purple. Make his um, face yellow, if you have it. And there you have a graphic that is big, bold, colorful, it's eye-catching. Um, if you want to go a step further, put a black border around it, and that just frames it in the sky. And you want to go another step further, take a color that's on the graphic and add it to the border. And there you have an award-winning kite. If it flies well, and if it's constructed well, um, you can win an award. I mean, you be the judge. So there is a difference. You know, this is just one simple graphic. It can take it so many directions in so many different ways. You need a paper and pencil next to your bed. 
At least I do. Um, I do a lot of thinking while I'm sleeping, and just like a dream, it often goes away when you wake up. So I know, talk to Alexa, talk to your phone, just record everything that you think of. Um, and it's a good idea to keep one outside of your shower as well. At least it is for me. Keep a journal. Um, you know, put a bookmark on your computer every time you name the bookmark ideas, and every time you see something cool on the internet, you know, throw a, a bookmark in the file, and then come back to it a couple months later, and you'll forget the ideas that you originally saw. You need a supportive spouse that understands your kite addiction. And there's a lot of husband and wife teams here that's it's, it's really good to see. And there's um, great examples, uh, you know, John and Karen Burkhart, um, Sandy and Ron Gibbon, um, John and Marianne Tranopole. Um, there, there's lots of them. How many how many um, spouses and spouses teams do we have here in this room? It's, it's great when you can work together. It's great when you support each other. Um, there's been a lot of divorces in the kiting world from kites. And I can raise my hand there. I know Cliff can raise his hand. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah, there's a few back there. <laughs> you need a willingness to learn and an ability to accept and correct mistakes. You will make mistakes. The Seam Ripper will be your best friend. <laughs> a good kite builder can make a mistake into something positive. And I learned that from Scott Spencer many, many years ago. A mistake is an unplanned improvement. Um, this is a kite I made many years ago. And right around, can you see the cursor? Is the cursor on the screen? Yeah. Right around here, there was a, I was relief cutting the fabric. And I poked right through a piece that I shouldn't have poked through. So I said, oh, how am I going to fix this? So I just took another piece of red and I sewed it on top of that one. And then I said, that looks pretty good. So I did it all over her hair. And I added some more over here where sometimes there's two layers of red. Sometimes there's one layer of red. Sometimes there's a layer of red on top of white. Sometimes the white is cut out. Um, but when this is backlit, it, it really shows some um, different kinds of shading that I really liked. And once I made this mistake, I carried it through on most of the other kites I made after this, on purpose. Uh, this is one of the last kites I made. Um, this is for an exhibit I did with uh, Terry Lee. Um, right here, on this, where this cloud is, that was a mistake. And I said, yeah, how am I going to fix that mistake? So I um, you know, added this, and I said, oh, well, this guy's playing a fiddle and sort of looks like there's notes or something flowing from the fiddle, so um, that's what I did, and I think it works. Um, the theme of this kite was um, uh, we had to take a, an excerpt from the Lewis and Clark exhibit and interpret it onto a kite. And my topic was Pierre Credot, I think was his last name, and he was a, a lead boatman on the, the river expedition, so his job was to navigate the rivers and avoid the obstacles. That's what was his job during the day. By night, he was a fiddle player for the troops. He entertained them all. And his favorite song to play on the fiddle was Rose Tree. So that's the name of this kite, Rose Tree. And I don't really long banner, <clears throat> excuse me, a long banner tail below it. And uh, the top section of this banner was a bunch of brown fabric that looked like tree roots. And if you look closely at the roots, it was actually people dancing. And at the bottom of the banner was a campfire with that layering technique. And, um, and if you look at the smoke coming up off the, f off the fire, it spelled out the words Rose Tree. So that's just one of the ones I've made. You need a thorough understanding of your sewing machine. You need to match the thread to the needle. You have to understand stitch width and stitch length. You understand upper and lower tension adjustments. You need to know how to thread the machine correctly. Um, this mistake happens a lot. And nine times out of ten, the way to solve this is to take all the thread out of the machine, take your bobbin out, blow all the tension um, discs, and re-thread the machine, put the bobbin back in, and nine, like I said, nine times out of ten, you solve this problem. Something usually gets stuck in the, um, the tension adjustment. 
The other cause of this problem is maybe you put the wrong size thread in your machine and it's too big for the, the hole in the needle. That will cause this. And make friends, make friends with your local sewing machine repairman. Um, that's important if you can find somebody locally to take the machine to. And every time you go in for a, a, a tune-up, um, bring in some fabric, bring in a thread that you usually use, and tell the guy to tune my machine to work with this fabric, and I usually can do that. Here's some advice from a Singer Sewing Machine Manual from 1949. Prepare yourself mentally for sewing. Think about what you're going to do. Never approach sewing with a sigh or relax daisically. Good results are difficult when indifference dominates. Never try to sew with a sink full of dirty dishes or beds unmade. When there are urgent housekeeping chores, do these first so that your mind is free to enjoy your sewing. When you sew, make yourself as attractive as possible. Put on a clean dress. Keep a little bag of French Put a little bag of French chalk to um, clean your fingers. Have your hair in order. Powder and lipstick put on. If you are constantly fearful that a visitor might drop in or your husband will come home and you will not look neatly put together, you will not enjoy your sewing. So, I don't know how much of that applies to today, um, but some of it does. You know, definitely clear your mind and try to you know put your problems away. Um, if you're sewing late at night and something else is on your mind, you will make a mistake. That's usually when the body runs out at the wrong time, or your fabric is folded underneath where it shouldn't be folded underneath, and you sew through four layers instead of two. Um, so if it's late at night, put your project to bed and, and work on it the next day. Um, something I learned from um, Scott Spencer, he used to always keep a bowl of M&Ms by a sewing machine. Every time he did something successfully, he'd eat an M&M. And he judged the, he judged the um, quality of his kite by how many M&Ms were left in the bowl at the end of his project. <laughs> Remember, we talked about this earlier, but workshop kites are okay. Um, often workshop kites are designed to be simple, easily taught to the masses. Now, I wasn't going to change this slide, um, but I decided to keep it in and talk a little bit about it. Um, the, the last point on here is think about ways to alter the plan, design, or graphics to make the kite more unique. Years ago, that's what we used to always ask while we were judging a kite. If you brought in a workshop kite, you had to declare it as a workshop kite, and most often the judges would say, okay, well, what did you do to make it yours? What did you do to, to change? How did you change it? How did you make it unique? And um, if you were successful in making those changes, we would award points for doing that. Last year we thought about it a little bit more, and I talked to Linda Larby a little bit, a little bit about it, and she expressed some concerns because she's an instructor and she likes to, she likes to when her students make the kite exactly the way she teaches the kite. It makes the flow of the class go much smoother. Um, a lot of times, if you're trying to make something different during a workshop kite, you end up having a problem, and then. The teacher has to come and help you with that problem and then it takes what time away from the other students. So on the Kite Makers Committee we decided to um, have a new award and we call it the Workshop Kite Award. And it's not necessarily based on score, um, it's a subjective view of the um, workshop kites that are entered in that competition. And you can win that special award without having anything unique done with your kite. You can just follow the instructions exactly and you can still win an award. But it's okay to take that workshop kite home and take the plan home and make another one and make some modifications and, and you know, take, make it unique, make it yours. It's mostly what workshop, workshops are about, is to learn, learning about kites um, and learning to put them together, not necessarily making them different. Back in 2004, the kite, we had used to do a bunch of kite workshops online on the Kite Builder Forum. This was the first one. We did a Della Porta. And this is the way the class was taught. And there's one here, there's one here. But some people went off in di different directions and changed the aspect ratios and changed the graphics around. And I remember going to Wildwood that year. There were so many Della Portas in the sky. I mean, Cliff probably remembers. It was really hard to judge them all, but it was really cool to see. 
So definitely workshop kites are okay to enter into competition. This was also a workshop kite back in 2000, taught by Sam Houston to the Maryland Kite Society. Um, the students built three of these tension cells and then put the three together to form a kite. But at the end of the retreat, a bunch of us got together and said, you know what, why don't we all put the kites together um, and enter them as a co-op in, um, I think this was, um, um, so, yeah, it's Drake Smith. I, I think it was down in Florida, but he Treasure ended Island? Yeah. Treasure Island, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So he put them all together, and they won second place in co-op that year. This is a great kite. I don't know why I don't see too many of these around. Um, I have the plan for it, um, so if anybody would ever want a copy of it, you know, let me know. So it's a pretty easy kite to build. And I think Cliff is. Are you doing this workshop? I did a workshop in Fort Warden doing that uh, tension sale. You're yeah. doing it again, or you did it? No, I did it okay. a few years ago, yeah. Okay. I still have the plans, I still have the jig that you need to make the fittings. You need to know your kite design. You know how to, you need to know how to adjust your bridle. Um, think about having different spars for different wind conditions in your back. And be prepared to fly in different wind and sun conditions. You need to know how well to fly your kite. And Randy is here, I think. I, I, I saw you and I wasn't sure. Is that, is that Randy? I think I have a picture of him in my slideshow. Um, proper and safe flying skills from launch to recovery, handling count counts. Uh, your kite isn't just judged on flight alone. It's judged on handling. So judges will be looking at how your kite is launched, um, how it flies, and how it's retrieved. So if you have a helper helping you, make sure the helper knows how to launch a kite. You don't want the helper letting go of one corner too late and having the kite arch over and take out, take out every other kite in the competition. Sometimes you do. <laughs> you know, jockey, the, the fields are usually big, you know, jockey around and, and look for a good position. Um, like I said earlier, the, the kite is, um, looks different whether it's front lit or back lit. Uh, it reminds me of a kite I saw one year entered. When it was front lit, I think it was a Rokaku, it was a girl in a bikini on the kite. When it was back lit, the bikini disappeared. <laughs> so he thought about the two different um, sun conditions. You need to bring note cards along the competition. Um, you're usually given a minute or two just to talk about your kite, and you can point out your accomplishments, explain what makes your kite unique, and what challenges did you overcome as you were building the kite. You need a sense of humor. After all, it is just kites, so um, try not to take it too seriously. A lot of times people come to the competition and just, they're so... There's so much anxiety and they're all tensed up and they end up not doing as well as they should. Just, you know, relax. We're all here to have fun. Deb Lenzen and Mike Shaw are perfect examples. In 2002, Deb Lenzen got special recognition for being just a, a wonderful cheerleader. If she was um, competing in a category, she wasn't just looking at her kite, she was looking at all the other kites and cheering them on. And when, if she wasn't competing in the category, she was on the sidelines cheering them on or giving people help launching their kites. And you need to be nice to the judges. Yes. Um, judging is a hard, hard job. And a lot of you, all of you are, are friends, and it's really hard to score your kite against other people's kites when you're friends. Um, but we have expert judges, and we do the best we can. You'll never receive the scores from each individual judge. You won't know who scored your kite, but you'll receive the, you know, the, the, the scores, but you won't know who they went to. And finally, you need to read and understand the AKA competition rule book. Um, you don't have to be an AKA member to get it. You just go to their website and you can download it. Um, the most recent edition is 2016. 
there have been some changes that have been made since then. We usually announce the changes, the competition in kiting prior to the competition. And it's one of the goals this year of the Kite Makers Competition to get this rule book rewritten with some of the, the new rules that are going to be set in concrete. So basically, your kite is judged for structural design, craftsmanship, visual appeal, and flight and handling. Uh, you'll get a score from 1 to 10 in each of those four criteria, and then it's totaled up, so a perfect score would be a 40. Structural design is, um, you know, the, the bones of the kite and how it's bridled, and does the structure contain significant unique features? Um, what kind of fittings did you use, if you used fittings? Um, are the materials sufficient but not excessive in weight and strength for the design? Do the bridle and the kite structure distribute forces on the sail evenly and efficiently? And does the kite maintain its intended shape or shapes in various wind speeds? For craftsmanship, that's basically how well is the kite sewn? How well is your applique? How well, how well is your um, um, pockets and seams done? What is your stitching like? What degree of skill and craftsmanship was required to make the kite? Are lines or seams straight when they are meant to be straight? Are corners square? Are curves smooth? Do points meet and are seams uniform? Is the work neat with threads and strings trimmed? No marks or spots from oil, glue, or paint? No ragged or burred edges? edges? Are the spars, joiners, connectors, or reinforcements or pockets well done? Are bridle lines tied securely and finished precisely? You don't have to do all that stuff, but if we see one kite where the um, lines are erased and the, the um, ends of the threads are trimmed, and another kite right inside of it that they're not, well, the, the one that does, goes those extra steps, you're going to get a couple extra points. Visual appeal, how attractive does the kite look while it's flying? Has the kite maker been able to create a new or more attractive visual images for the kite of a given category? Do the colors contrast or blend well when the kite is flown at a distance or nearby? Um, usually the kite has to fly at 100 feet. So keep that in mind when you're doing your graphics. Does the mechanical structure of the kite enhance or detract from the appearance of the kite? Is the kite's concept original? Are the choices of the kite form and sail materials appropriate for the artistic concepts? And flight and handling. Um, does the kite launch and take off easily and then achieve a good angle of flight for its type? Is the kite steady? Does the kite fly in a manner appropriate to its type? Is the flyer able to keep the kite steady in variable winds? Does the flyer maintain good control of each kite and line? Can the retriever, but can the flyer retrieve the kite to a controlled landing? All these questions and these criteria are the questions that the judges ask themselves as they're judging your kite, so it's important to understand what they're going to be looking at. So that's mostly the things that you need and, and the things that you don't need. Um, over the years, I went through my collection of, of photos and I just highlighted some of the ones that were competed with that I, you know, stood out to me. There were so, there were so, so many, I couldn't complete them all, but just the ones that I noticed as I went through. First one is um, Randy Tom, who's grand champion in 1990. My first kite retreat was for Maryland Kite Society, and I never forget John Burkhart was there with a um, Randy Tom Rokaku. And I always saw the kites and kite lines, and I said, well, I don't know how they do all those details on those images. And I remember going up to that Rokaku and looking at it really close in the front, looking at it from behind, figuring out how different layers were cut on the front of the kite, layers that were cut in the back of the kite, and how those black lines were formed. And I was just amazed. And uh, um, it was good to see you know, this kite win in 1990. Barry Poulter in 2007 won second place in Bode um, with this Edo. Um, what's cool about this kite is the whale that is jumping out of the water but it's just not the kite, it's also the um, bridling. Those long bridles coming off the kite almost seem like it's water splashing down when you're looking at it. And to me, it just is a really, really cool effect. 
And I said, size doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. This is probably less than three feet tall. But I remember seeing this kite in 2001, uh, made from by Tom McCune. It was called Merwind, and just put a smile on my face. And you know, I looked at it and I said, you know what? I, I love it when the graphic matches the, 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 the you know, the, the sail. Um, so the, you know, the sail matches the graphic, the graphic matches the sail, and it, it just makes you smile when you see it. And when we looked it up, at, when we looked at it up close. You know, he didn't just sew on a white beard, he went a couple of steps further and he added some decorative white stitching on the beard to give it a little texture. It's just something neat to see. Samurai Designs by Adrian and Merle Bomber. This was also sort of a workshop kite. Um, Kevin Shannon taught of his warrior graphic techniques on Rokakus, and Adrian and Merle individually made their own kite, and then Adrienne took them home and decided to merge them together and added uh, the sectional tail on the back and the fuzzy tails, and it turned out to really be a really cool, cool, cool kite. I've never seen one done like this ever again, and ended up winning the best steam award in 2007. Is that painted or all applicated? It's all applicated. Mm -hmm. This is a single color cellular kite made by Phil Broder and he won second place in cellular. And it's just a cool kite. I mean, you, I remember seeing this in competition at, at every different angle you looked at it, you tried, how was that kite built? How was that put together? You, it looked so different at every, every different angle. And then he added the tails. And tails are sort of a, um, a catch-22. Because if you're entering a cellular kite, most often it should fly without a tail. So the flight judge might take a couple points off to, when he sees a cellular kite flying with a tail. But the visual appeal judge sees the tail on this kite and says, that looks kind of neat. And he might add points on it for visual appeal. I kind of think it looks nice with the tail. I like that. Was this your own design or Phil? I think so. Never, honestly, I've never flown it again after that. <laughs> 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 what, I, what I remember is that I've had, that you can't see it in the sunlight. I made that kite for night flying. It has, uh, I used a black reflective tape to make graphics on it. Well, so, this would be a good workshop kite. Yeah. No? <laughs> Here's another one. <laughs> again, by Phil Broder, he got third place in the figure. I, again, the figure of the, the figure, the graphics fit the kite, and it's basically a roller. And he just extended the, the wings. He, had, he changed the, the keel section to match the graphics of the kite, and um, it's, a, it's a cool kite. I mean, it's, wasn't this stole by somebody in China? Yeah. Yeah. And Vietnam. And Vietnam. Not the kite, but the kite design was reproduced. Um, Deb Lenzen, um, in 2002, won this one on the top and grand champion with this one on the bottom. Well, I was not present to visually see this kite on the bottom, so I can't guarantee whether this was applique or if it was seamed. I'm not sure. It's but folded. It's, it's all seamed. Okay. It's folded and seamed. Well, in 2002, she also did it um, all folded and seamed. And if you want to um, show off your craftsmanship, do a kite like this. And to get all those points matched up and everything lined up properly, that is not an easy kite to build. Um, Pete Dolphin in 2003 um, got first place in cellular with his, his version of Andre's kite. And he missed Grand Champion to Lamb Hawk by one one hundredth of a point. He was so mad. <laughs> do, you remember, do you remember why? Why? There's one star that is rotated just slightly different than the others. <laughs> Were you a judge that year? No, but I remember people will not stop telling that story. <laughs> well, you can't make a kite perfect. If your kite is perfect, make a mistake on purpose. Just make it imperfect. It's like those people that make stairs, and they put the balusters in the stair, and not the one baluster they put in upside down, just so it's not perfect. And Bobby Stanfield in 1992. This kite has memories for me because I said I started Kite Studio in 1989. Um, 
I lived in Doylestown, Pennsylvania back then. And um, when we first got into kiting, I scoured all the magazines for, um, and I circled all of the vendors sending out catalogs. And I found a vendor in Doylestown, Pennsylvania that sold fabric. It was called the Fabric Lady. And the, the owner of that store was Bill Tyrell. And I became very good friends with Bill. Um, I lived less than five minutes away, and I was there every two weeks, maybe every week, just to buy some fabric and talk to him about, about fabric. And he knew that I was making stunt kites back then. And so I got a phone call one afternoon, and he said, Steve, I got a kite buddy here from California. He's developed a strobe light, and he's going to put it on his single, big single line kite, but he wants to see how this strobe light works on a cellular, or on a, a stunt kite. He said, can you bring one of your stunters over and we'll fly it tonight in the church parking lot or in a church field. So I said, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll bring it right over, Bill. So I went over that night and we had a little dinner in, in his living room. And um, I, I remember walking into his living room and, and there's this guy with his big kite taking up almost the whole living room. And Bill said, I'd like you to meet Bobby Stanfield. And I said, Bobby Stanfield? I've been reading all about him in all these kite magazines. It was so cool to actually meet him. And um, we went to the church that night after it got dark, and Bobby put a, a strobe light on this kite, and I put one of his strobes on my stunt kite, and the police showed up. People were calling, <laughs> reported us a, reported a UFO, so I'll never, I'll never forget that. And I have to add kites from John Burkhart. Um, John, like I said, he has a great selection of color. Um, so he has just a big palette to always choose from. All of his kites have really cool um, RC kind of graphics with a lot of swooshes and a lot of curves and swirls. You can tell the John Burkhart kite when you see it. And you can't see it in this picture, but there's a really long banner tail beneath this that has more work than the kite itself. And it was a deserving win in 2008. 2006, Xiao Ji Xin entered um, a bunch of kites. And this is one of them. This was a mechanical lobster made from paper. And it was framed in bamboo. And if you look closely, right here, there's a little propeller. And that propeller would spin. And on the back of the propeller was a, a gear that was made handmade from bamboo. And when the propeller spun, the gear spun, and when the gear spun, the pinchers in the um, claw opened and closed in the air. Now, he didn't have a very good flight, but that was an amazing kite. But he did win that year. He actually won um, grand champion for the dragon kite that he made. And this also was made from paper and um, bamboo. And here's a, a sphere that turned in the mouth. And when the sphere turned, a gear turned. And when the gear turned, another gear turned. And then the eyes would go up and down as you were watching the kite in the wind. Steve, can I add something to that? Sure. Uh, due to the mechanical of action of the ball turning, the eyes went back and forth, the eyebrows went up and down, the whiskers spin, oh. and the mouth open and closed. Yes. Okay, you so remember it was more this than complete me. mechanical marvel yeah. mm -hmm. of... All that stuff because there's loss with each one that you do, mm -hmm. and that one did so much. Yeah, that was that was, that was a really cool kite to see. Next thing, we don't get many of these entered in competition, but this year we actually had two. Um, Eric Wolf also entered yes. this one, and you, it's hard to see in this picture, but there was a, a framework for the head I made out of um, graphite, and then he didn't put a skin on top of the. Uh, frame. He just added the, the eyes and the, and the mouth, and that flew well too, and it, it went second place with that one. We talked about this earlier. This is The Lady of the Clouds by Tana Ames in 1996. She got first place in the traditional. I think this was just the second year that she entered a competition. Really good craftsmanship. And you can't talk about Tana Ames without talking about Glenn Haynes. And this is a really good example if you want to make a big kite, but you can just make a small kite and make lots of them and join them together. And, and Glenn in um, Gettysburg this year, he made um, a train of eddies 
all the different character from the Civil War printed on each one of them. And one first place in arches. And I just had to throw this one in because Jackie Maciel is the other half of Dick Maciel who did all the um, adhesive kites. She always, every year she came back and she always made me smile because she took a theme of the convention and put it onto a kite. Um, this was in um, 2006, we were at Iowa. Um, she came back in 2009, we were in Rochester. And I just, I love this one with the drops of blood as the tail. It just, just makes, again, just makes me smile. And this, I don't know if I like this more for just the picture or for the kite. But it, it was just so cool to see this dimensional kite next to the Washington Monument. And um, Philip Jones was a, a really, or is a good kite builder from the Kite Builder Forum back in these days. And uh, I think he was from, he was a dentist from out of the country, I think. Bermuda. Bermuda, yeah. I don't know, is he still around? Anybody know? He bought something from me like six years ago, last I've heard. He made a bunch of different kites. I have to add, I have to um, include Charlie Dutton. He's also one that goes back to the first time I went to the MKS retreat and saw that, um, that Rokaku, because he also made a lot of Rokakus in a different style than Randy Tom, a different applique technique. But he's done a bunch of these, and they're all always impressive. And while we're on Rokakus, I'll never forget this one, The Duke by Jerry Oak in 2006, won first place in Rokaku. And this is a big, bold graphic in white, black, and red. For some reason, those three colors always look really good together. You'll see a bunch more later. Um, and I'll never forget this kite. This is one year we had, I don't know if there were 20 Rakakus entered into the competition. And all the, all the visual appeal judges were, were standing downwind, just looking at all the, all the kites. And all the flight judges were off to the side, looking at all the kites flying at an angle. And you guys, the best way to judge for a cocktail category because you can just see how each one is flying. And this one was just nailed to the sky for the whole period of the competition and it was flying at the highest angle. So it was, you know, he definitely had it perfectly tuned. Here's another Rakaku. This one's, with, um, I'm pretty sure it's Design Master Paints. It just, it just, you know, makes you smile when you see it. I, I like how he made the, the sun's rays, you know, expand, extend past the border. I love the, you know, the different colors on the border. Uh, it's just a big, bold graphic, very colorful. Um, the, the, you know, the cool fluorescent green eyes staring down at you. He won second place for that in 2007. And while we're on a theme of faces, this is The Man in Black by Kelvin, who is no longer with us. Um, this won Kite of the Year in 2006 on the Kite Builder Forum. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the story, but I know the Johnny Cash family found out about this kite. I don't know if the Cash family got this one or a copy of it, um, but there is this kite in the um, Johnny Cash family. And this is a Cody that's not a Cody. Um, <laughs> it looks really, really neat up close, and it looks totally different from far away. John, going with this in 2007, he was at KitePiller.com's Kite of the Year. And here's a, the, the combination of red, black, and, and white again with a little bit of, of blue thrown in. Um, Cheryl did a wonderful job this year and won first place in soft. Just, I love the, you know, the, the black and white checkers. And there's another one, black, white, and red by Sam King in 2007, won first place. And here's another example of how you can make a small kite and, you know, join it together with other ones and making a one large kite. And you know, kind of limited colors, purple, turquoise, white, and black, and just looks great together. I'm not sure. I found this in my collection. It wasn't entered in competition. I think it's Jose's kite. No? I'm not sure whose it is, but it's one of those kites you look at and you don't really understand what's going on. You don't understand the graphic. But then once you see it and you figure it out, it just kind of makes you stare at it some more. That might have been Mike Shaw. Yeah. Mike Shaw? Possibly. <laughs> Sharon Musto. Yes. Sharon Musto. Okay. I didn't have it. I didn't have it. Canada. 
Here's a train by um, Bob Lockhart, and it's just a train of all different cartoon characters. Um, here's the guy from Kentucky Fried Chicken, and it's just, again, one of those types that makes you smile and makes you stop and stare and try to figure out what's going on in each one of the sails. And again, it's in the red, white, and black. Um, it sort of reminds me of an idea I always wanted to do. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to have books, and I, on the bottom corner of the book, I would put a little character, and then the next page, I would change the character all the way through like 100 pages and then flip it. I always thought you could do something like that on a kite. It would be a, a, a cool idea to see that progression of the, of the, the cartoon change. Rick Mickman in 2002, he was a, one of my best customers back in the early 2000s. He bought a lot of fabric from me and he was from the Ro Rhode Island area. And he, he convinced me to come to Newport for the festival. And I, we had a kite competition there, and I met him finally, and he won an award with this kite. And I said, Rich, this is really cool. You, you should bring this to AKA. He did in 2002, and he got second place in the figure. This was from an uh, album cover, a uh, Grateful Dead album cover. And I just, it's, you can't tell in this picture. These are one of the early days when we really didn't have good cameras. But you know the way the eyes glowed in the sky was, was really neat. This is another husband and wife team, Blair Cliff and Jerry Pinnell. They've done a lot of kites together and a lot of good kites together and won a bunch of awards. And I just saw this as I was scrolling through and it was an interesting delta derivative. Um, I like the colors, I like the, you know, what's going on here in the center. They won third place in cooperative that year. And again, I have to include John and Karen. They won grand champion in the co-op category. Um, in 2015. This is another one where you, you know, Karen did, I think Karen did the graphics and John did all the construction and assembly. But it just sort of tells a story of, you, know, you one of the things I always did is I had judge, when judges, when kites were judged, um, I asked everybody, what is the name of your kite? And what inspired you to name it that way? And when I was doing the award ceremonies, I would always, you know, talk about that inspiration. And, um, I just find it interesting on how people name their kite. And of all of John Pollock's kites, um, this is my favorite. Um, the ones I've shown earlier, a lot of the graphics do go away at 100 feet, but not on this one. It definitely is big, it's bold, it's colorful. She stares down at you, and um, it's a great, it's an interesting kite. I think it was called like Harlequin, something like that. It was his daughter. It's his daughter. Oh, that's his daughter? Yeah. Oh, I didn't hear that part of it. <laughs> that makes it even better. I also, I had to include um, Cliff's kite, the double, 12 point double star. He won Grand Champion in 2012 or 2005. Now, this was a very popular kite on the Kite Builder Forum in the early 2000s. Up until Cliff, most of them were <clears throat> smaller kites, 10 point stars. Um, Cliff went an extra step and added the 12th point, or the extra two points, and it ended up being a lot bigger, and the engineering for the sparring and the fittings was, was a lot further than they were on a 10-point on a star. I should fly this more often. The hardest thing, I think, is launching it. Yeah. It's the only kind I've ever seen you get a big round of applause when it crashed. <laughs> <laughs> it crashed for tap. <laughs> so another um, I kite off of the forum. Um, Peter Ross was very active back in the early 2000s. And he ended this kite in um, 2008 and was uh, second place. It's, it's cool. You would think when that's flying that it would be rotated 90 degrees and flying from the point, but it doesn't. It actually flies almost vertically like that. So it just was cool to see the sky. And there's a lot of reflection stuff going on here in the center panel. I have to add Jose, his uh, New Zealand star, first place grand champion in 2002. Jose, you can tell a Jose kite when you see it, and this is one of them. Um, it's really neat to see what he did with the, how he terminated the ends of the sail. Most people would just put a pocket or a fitting on there and terminate the spar. Jose went further and had the spars extend past the sail, and it just adds, a, you know, great um, interest to the kite. 
There is one that came after this, similar to this, and then at the end of each one of the spars, you had a um, like a ping pong ball or a, 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 a little ball with some with, with fluttering things at the end, sparkly things on the end. It was just it was really cool. Yeah. This was just posted on a, a Facebook, Kite Builders Facebook group just last week or the week before. And I told Mike that I was gonna include it in the presentation because it, it was a great use of color. And I just love the yellow with the black border. And it's one of those interesting graphics that makes you stop and stare and try to figure out what it is. And it's not, it's, fly, it, it's flying without a tail. You know, um, any kites are not supposed to fly with a tail. And, but most often you see them flying with a tail because they're still hard to control. But he, he did it right. Along the same time period, I saw this like um, a week or two ago. I think Phil, bro, did you post this one? Yeah. How do you pronounce Alicia? How do you pronounce her name? Alicia Shalska. Alicia. Alicia. And where is she from? Do you know? From Poland, but now in the Netherlands. Great kite. Again, um, interesting graphics, great colors. Um, why don't you stop and stare and try to figure out what it is? Have to include um, George Peter's kites. This is this is George Peter down here. Recently, um, Hansi made his version of one of George's kites and posted it on the on Facebook group. Both of them are you know, yeah, definitely cool colors and graphics. Remember, one year I had to dress up for a um, Halloween party, and I made one of the. I think I made just this one, just like this, as a mask to wear. And I have, of course, got to add Ron into this collection. Um, Ron, you always know a Ron's kite. Um, he's known for color, shape, style, whimsy. Um, who else but Ron takes a circle and adds the stripes and the, and the, and the, and the honeycombs and the, and the gray colors together. Ron, this is my, my, I don't know, I haven't seen all of your kites lately, but I love this kite when I saw it. And I don't know the name of it. I don't know the story behind it. I would like to find out. Uh, it's, called, just... it's called Serendipity. And it's a commissioned kite for Paul de Bakker. It took a little bit of time. Um, it looks, com I mean, it's a combination of simplicity and, com and complexity as well, particularly with the hair. As you can see, it's divided in the center, so separating the two halves is easy, but the bottom isn't. So mm -hmm. the crossing of the hair coming out to the other side was the the key of making that work. However, it was not easy. It was pretty complicated to get it to, to keep everything flat. And once again, we're sewing a lot of stuff all at once, which you talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And that's what made that kind of complicated. So it hangs in their house. But when they come to Oregon for a festival that I'm there, or Long Beach, Whiskey, the kite's in the air. So it's not only a decoration for the house, mm -hmm. but it's functional and it flies at all the festivals out on West, which makes me very happy. Yeah, I don't right. like just wall hanging. So right. you know, <laughs> I know it makes a great decoration in a home, but it's still a kite. Mm -hmm. you know, so. And you said serendipity? It's called serendipity. I forget there was a special meaning to that. I forget exactly what <coughs> brought that about. This is another one. It's classic Gibeon. You know, you see that kite. You know, you know it's it's Ron's. I mean, it reminds me of, of one that I couldn't find a picture of. Very early, he was, we were doing some cellular kites, and you're doing the really um, the high aspect um, cellular pieces, oh, yeah. all in orange. And I think you did another version in yellow. I, I couldn't find any of those pictures, but. Um, I remember that being really I'll find neat stuff and send it to you. Okay. you know? Thank you. I'm having a lot of old slides and things from the past digitized so so they can be applied to a program. Because I also have a lot of stuff on print, you know, that's what we have there. Right. And Simon Crafts um, ex extensivity. Um, just love the way the the, um, the color pieces are woven together to add Additional color. It just looks great. It flew great. I remember that kite. 
And finally, Paul Dugard in 2022 won grand champion with a stack of um, these quad kites. He was a real, he is a really good flyer, and he knew that when the when the, the flight judges were watching this kite, he was doing crazy maneuvers with this kite in, in low wind conditions. And um, then when the uh, visual appeal judges came through. Um, he would put that parking kite right in front of the sun, and you would see it right through it. And then he would just turn it a little bit, and this was made with polyester, and the shimmering polyester in the sun, which is, you know, and the, and the, com com the combination of the, of the colors down the line um, really made it, a, made it a winner. So that's about um, all I have. Um, I just, again, want to thank you for letting me do this. Um, I make three plugs here to support your local kite clubs. Uh, try to you know subscribe to the Kite Builders Facebook page. It's you know a simple free thing, and you know join the American Kite Builders Association. That's all I got. Anybody has any questions?